Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Ryan Rampton, and he's going to tell us about his near-death experience, but you've got a lot of experiences to share as well. So I'm going to let you uh, start wherever you like and take as long as you like. Oh, right on. So um, again, my name is Ryan Rampton. I'm a firefighter paramedic. Um, I've uh, done a lot of things over the years, and uh, I'll I'm also a commercial photographer, a professional photographer. So I took a break for about 10 years, um, actually about 18 years when uh, between the fire department and just did photography full time. Well, during that time, I had a photography studio and I it got it had been photographing a family earlier in the day. And one of the kids was acting really wild and ended up knocking over one of my lights. And so it's the big professional studio light and uh, has a flash tube in it and all this. And it, it broke the light. And I thought, don't worry about it, you know. Um, and later in that day, I decided I would take care of it. Well, my kids have been watching a movie in our projector room. So we had a big video projector and they were watching on the big screen a movie. And we were watching it you know, together. And I got, got almost to the end and I'd seen the show, you know, a dozen times with them. And I thought it started thinking about this light that I was going to go out and try to fix it. So I got up and I went out to the studio part and um, got the light and started messing with it. And it was all broken. So I'm taking broken plastic pieces off and the, um, com uh, the plug was like a computer plug that has the, the black cord that plugs into the three metal prongs in the back like a computer. And so that whole piece had broken off. So I had all that out here with wires hanging off of it. And I started pulling on the wires and trying to take it apart. And I had this feeling of impending doom, like, oh, I'm going to get electrocuted. And I thought, well, I better go unplug this. So I went over and I had, uh, had like a double wall socket where four lights were plugged in and I went over and unplugged it. Well, unbeknownst to me, I unplugged the wrong one. So I went back and I'm starting to play with it and I'm trying to get a grip on it to pull this plastic piece off. So I've got these three metal prongs sticking up uh, that are plugged into the cord and I've got this plastic piece that's kind of broken and I can't get a good grip on it. So I'm a pretty smart guy, like the MacGyver things, you know, figure things out. So decided in my brilliance to use my teeth as pliers. So I bit down on it to get a good grip and pull on that. And those three metal prongs touch my tongue and 110 volts goes straight into my brain. And I could not move a muscle. Like completely locked me up. And it really surprised me at first. I didn't realize it was going to do that. I'd been electrocuted before, but I didn't know that I would be locked up where I couldn't move a muscle, that my muscles were just frozen. So I'm trying, and I'm a pretty strong guy, and I'm pulling with all my strength, trying to pull this cord out, and I can't budge it. I can't move. Like, then I tried to move my eyes to see if, like, my kids had seen what was going on, and they were going to come and unplug the cord from the wall and I couldn't move my eyes. Like nothing was moving, including my heart. So my heart's frozen too. Everything in my body is completely frozen and the muscles are all locked up. And I'm like, okay, well, I've been in worse situations than this. I, how many times have I tried to die and God saved my life, you know? And so that's what's going to happen. I'm pretty sure, you know, um, I've been in lots worse situations. So I'm kind of waiting for something to happen, like a circuit breaker to pop or the kids to come in, you know, something to happen. And nothing's happening except I'm frying. Like I'm, I don't know if you've been electrocuted and it's that little bite. Well, this was like every cell in my body was just on fire, you know, and it was so painful. And I just kept thinking, okay, well, something's going to happen. And then I could see black smoke billowing out of my mouth, like almost like an old locomotive is just puffing out of my mouth. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, this is not good. 
like um i know <laughs> your body's not supposed to do this this is uh definitely and i thought to myself i'm dead like i'm gonna die and i went oh my gosh are you kidding me like i'm gonna die from stupidity for putting an electrical cord in my mouth like I'm going to get a dang Darwin award. You know, I'm going to be a joke on the internet about this idiot that bit on an electrical cord and died. And I thought, no, that's, that's not fair. Like I couldn't die when I almost got in a plane crash, flying and flying my airplane, got inverted in the clouds. No, no, no. I can't die that way. You know, in a blaze of glory, I can't die when I was scuba diving and I ran out of air offshore and uh, almost drowned. No, nope, can't die doing something I love. Can't die in a car crash, a motorcycle accident. Like all these times I, I should have died. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. And uh, oh, no, and I can't die like when I was a firefighter and I got caught in this flashover and, and saved this little boy's life. Can't die a hero. How am I going to die? I'm going to die from stupidity. Well, this is just great. <laughs> and I'm just all mad about that. And then I could see this really bright light up above my head. And I remember like looking up into the light. And But if you remember, I couldn't move anything. So it wasn't really me looking up. I was still doing this. But I looked up into the light and it was the, I just remember seeing this light come down from the ceiling. And it was the most beautiful light I'd ever seen. It was just so inviting and enthralling. And I remember going up through my body and going into the light. And I had the feeling of movement or motion or traveling through the light. And then I ended up in this pure white room. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm dead. Like, wow, I'm dead. And I, there was no disappointment, no sadness. Like, I was so excited that I was going home to God. And I... Like, was so just like a little kid at Christmas. Like, I don't know if you remember that when you were a little kid, but I remember my parents said I could get up at 7 a.m. And I remember waking up like at 5 and looking at the clock, you know, constantly waiting for it to change. Finally, it was like 6.59, and the anticipation was just building to such an extreme. I couldn't wait, you know, for that 7 o'clock thing so I could run in and open my presents. Well, Times that by a million, and that's about what I felt. I was so excited to go home to God. And then I'm all alone in this pure white room, and I could see a light up above me, and it got brighter and brighter and brighter, and then it resolved into a personage, and it came down and stood in front of me, and it was, it was God. Um, and I knew it. Yeah, I knew it was my father. And I have never been more complete, more in love, more like so fulfilled as in that moment when I was with God. Like it was like anything that could have happened to me in this life was completely healed in that moment. And I felt so perfect and so in love and just like it was the most amazing, completing feeling like. It's so hard to put into words um, and people that have had near death experiences like you will understand that. How do you explain something like the taste of salt to somebody that's never experienced that? Well, God's love was so incredible that I've never felt anything on this earth, even, even remotely close to it. And so it was so amazing. And then God like showed me my whole life. Like it just flashed in front of my eyes and it would stop and we would relive something and then move on. And every time it was like, did you see what you learned from that? Did you like, that was the feeling. There was absolutely no judgment. Everything was a beautiful, perfect lesson for me to learn from. And I remember this part that had just happened recently where my, um, ex-wife will was my wife at the time had left me for her best friend's husband left me with four little kids and i was so des des devastated he just completely crushed and i remember seeing that from god's perspective and him showing me this and it was like why was i so upset about that i remember thinking that like it was such a beautiful experience for me to learn about me 
And I felt nothing but love for my ex-wife and her situation. And it was just the most beautiful thing. And then when I got back to earth, I'm like, no, I still hate her. <laughs> you know, no, I really don't. We're, we're good friends now. But at the time, you know, the pain and the suffering that we go through here is so real and, and it blinds us. And when we see things from God's perspective, when we see our life through his perspective, it's so beautiful and it's completing and everything's a perfect lesson. No matter how bad the situation you're going through, it is beautiful and perfect for you. And it is exactly what should be happening. And it's that having that faith and that trust in God, knowing that he's got us is the key to that. Well, this all ended. And then God said to me, he says, do you want to come home with me or do you want to go back to them? And he did this with his hand. He upside down, just kind of did this. And the floor we were standing on was pure white and it started to go foggy and then go clear. And then we were standing in the air about 20 feet above my kids. And the movie was just ending in the theater room. And I could see them doing little shadow puppets and, and like attacking each other, you know, and doing these little shadow puppets. And I watched them do all this. And my heart just sunk. And I'm like, I can't leave them. They need me. And it was like right in the middle of my divorce um, where my wife was leaving me for this other guy. And it was like such a traumatic time. And I knew my kids needed me so bad. And I was like, no, they need me. And I said that to God. I'm like, I can't, I can't come home. And God said, okay, I'll see you again. And I thought there was going to be like this big hug goodbye or at least a high five or a slap on the butt and say, go get him, tiger. You know, something. No, no. I instantly I'm back in my body. And it was like getting hit by a truck. Like I go from the most beautiful, blissful state I've ever been in to wham, I'm back in my body and I get hit by the electricity. And my thought was, my gosh, like, why would God send me back to my body, but not get me off the electricity? I'm still being electrocuted. And I heard God's voice just as clear as somebody speaking to me. And he said, oh, did you ask for help? So God has a sense of humor. I'll tell you right now. He's a little bit of a smart ass. And I love him so much. And, but like, it was so just like, did you ask for help? But it's so true. How often do we get in situations and we don't ask for help? And God is bound to let us experience that until we do ask for help. That's so funny because so, I have said a few times recently, people say, what's one thing you've learned out of Heard all these NDEs, and I said, ask. Yes, it's key. It's so critical. And it was just so cute how he asked it. It's like, oh, did you ask for help? And I was like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, dear God, please help. And as soon as I said that, the cord moved. So if you remember, I'm holding onto this cord right here, and I'm trying to pull it out, and I'm just being electrocuted. I'm doing the funky chickens, black smoke's coming out. And I, felt it like pull down and move and i went oh my gosh so i grabbed it and i started pulling well here's the interesting thing like no matter how strong i am i could be the incredible hulk and i could not overcome your own muscles when you're being electrocuted so the impossible part god overcame but he still made me do every bit of effort that i could to get that cord out of my mouth i remember struggling and pulling on that and then it popping out of my mouth and it was like that was keeping me awake or alert. I don't know, the electricity. Because as soon as I unplugged it, it was like unplugging a TV. Like my vision went whoom, and everything went black. And I hit the ground. And about that time, my kid hears me that's 12 years old. And he comes running in and sees me laying on the ground. And so he runs over and starts shaking me. And he said that I just took this breath, this spontaneous breath. My eyes popped open and I went, and he went, oh my gosh. And that, that's all I remember seeing him is this, oh gosh. And he grabs the phone, he calls 911 and he says, I just found my dad on the ground, a black smoke's coming out of his mouth and he's got a big hole in his tongue and he wasn't breathing. And I start shaking him and he took a breath, you know. Well, anyway, they took me up to the hospital and 
wheel me in and the doctor comes in and examines me and he looks at my tongue and I had charcoal, a piece uh, about the size of a quarter right through the middle of my tongue where those three metal prongs had touched. It gotten so hot in there that it didn't, didn't just cook the meat, it burnt it to charcoal. So when he pushed on it, it just crumbled. Um, it got so hot in there that it melted the fillings in my mouth. The, the, the silver fillings in my teeth turned all to silver. And they were, instead of that black color that they kind of are, you know, after years, they were like brand new again. They were all shiny. And I had one that actually exploded and broke apart. And the doctor looks at it and he looks at my mouth and he says, well, I'm not worried about your tongue. He says, your tongue's going to heal up. You know, within just a matter of weeks, he says, the tongue's one of the most fastest healing parts of your body if it's injured. He said, so your tongue's going to be fine. You're going to end up with a nice scar in the story. And I've got yeah, just a little yeah. scar right there. So you can see that. So that's all I ended up with that. And then he said, the dentist will be able to fix your teeth. And he said, you'll get a crown or whatever. And not worried about your teeth. I'm not worried about your tongue. He said, what I am worried about, he said, is when you take 110 electricity in your body, it cooks you from the inside out. He says, where 220 will blow off body parts and burn you externally. He says, 110 will cook you internally. He says, so what I'm worried about is every one of your organs being cooked. He says, it's not if that happened, it's how bad. Because given the damage in your mouth and the time that you were down, he says, it's, it's not if, it's how much. He said, so we're going to do some enzyme tests on you. We're going to do some blood work. We'll be able to see what enzymes and what organs were, and were damaged by what enzymes have been given off. Like troponin, when you have a heart attack, your heart gives off troponin, which is an enzyme, a cardiac enzyme, which uh, it identifies that you've had a heart attack. So as these organs are damaged, they give off different enzymes. And so he, they were afraid my airway was going to swell. So they put me out, they innovated me. And in the morning, they woke me up and the tube was out and they're taking my IVs off. And then the doctor comes in and he comes over and he says, well, he says, I've discharged you from the hospital. You can go home. And I'm like, what? He says, yeah, he said, I ran your enzyme three test three times because I didn't believe the results. I even went down and supervised it at the lab the last time because I thought they must be doing something wrong. He says, I was so afraid you were going, going to MODS, which is multiple organ um, failure. And he said, and die in the night. He said, I can't believe that you have zero enzymes in your blood. He says, there's nothing wrong internally with you it's all in your tongue he says that's physically impossible how electricity works he says you're a miracle he says i'm a man of science not of faith he says but go home and count your blessings so i went home and i was like kind of just almost blown away from it like the whole experience like i wasn't really sure and i didn't ever feel like i had been a very righteous man which you consider like good church guy, you know, and all this. And I always had this love for God in my heart. Like ever since I was a little kid, loved God. But I always felt like I uh, so, uh, like so came to my sins too easily. And so I always thought I was a bad person, you know. And then I had this experience with God and he was going to take me home with him. And I just, I couldn't quite you know, correlate the two together. And I'm like, I didn't feel like I had the right to talk to anybody about God because I wasn't like a religious guy or anything. So I kind of kept my mouth shut. I told my um, soon to be ex-wife and I told my parents and that was about it. And then like 12 years go by and I had gotten remarried and build a business and all this. And I had this experience like 12 years later and I was going through another divorce. We lost this business that was worth millions and kind of had an investor try to steal it from us and tie us up in court and, and just ruined everything. And I was 
I was so depressed. And I remember I was, I was up at this place called Lava Hot Springs in Idaho. And it was on New Year's Day, 2013, like 12 years after my near-death experience. And I was praying to God. And I was like, I'm done. Like, I made the wrong choice in coming back. Like, I do not want to be here. And I'm begging God, like begging him. I'm like, I don't want to take my own life. But give me an aneurysm, drop a meteor on me, a heart attack. I don't care, but I want to come home. I made the wrong decision. Like, please, please just, you know, and I'm begging God to take me home. And I heard God's voice physically again. And the last time I heard it, he said, oh, do you want, did you ask for help? This time I heard leaving my presence one time is traumatic for everyone because you leave nothing but the presence of love for you to remember what my love feels like and chose to leave a second time has left such a hole in you that you've tried to fill it with everything but me. But what you really want is me. And when God said that something happened to me physically there was a change that came over me. Like I felt a physical clunk in my body. Like it was like clunk. And I shouted at the top of my lungs and I put my fist in the air and I'm like, dude, I'm yours. And yelled that at the top of my lungs. Well, there was people at the hot springs and I'm sure they thought I was crazy. You know, this guy off by himself and all of a sudden yells, dude, I'm yours at the sky, you know? But I didn't really care at that moment. Um, I felt God claim me as much as I was claiming him. Like it was this incredible um, claiming of each other. Like I was God's, he was mine. And I, I made him a promise right then and there. I'm like, I everything I own, everything I will ever do is yours. And I will speak to people about you. I will tell People of your love. And so at that point, I had what I call my God change. And I started telling people about my near death experience. And I started telling people about how God sees us and how much he loves us. And I walked around for like two weeks after this experience in a complete bliss cloud. Like it was the closest that I had ever been to heaven outside of heaven. Like I felt like a spiritual being having a temporary physical experience, not this physical being that every once in a while we have a spiritual experience. And I had so many incredible things happen during this two week period when I was so connected to God. Like uh, I've got this tattoo of Michael, the archangel on this shoulder. And Michael came to me and told me who I was in the preexistence and told me, um, what I was and, and that I was a warrior angel, you know, and what, what my purpose was that I was a oh, warrior angel. Warrior. So, um, that I was one of his warrior angels. So Michael, if you know much about him, he's like the leader of God's army. Right. And he's a warrior angel and protects us from evil. Well, that was one of the things that he told me during that time. And then, I had some other experiences that were just so incredible um, that helped define me as a person and define my role of what I was. Like, I remember I got done photographing this wedding and I was walking down the street and this homeless lady came up to me and she was like really bad meth teeth, if you've ever seen that. And she was probably 35, but she looks like she was 70 just because, you know, the drugs, what they'd done to her body. And she asked me if I had any money and I checked my pockets. I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't. And I started to walk away from her. And in my head, I remember going, she's repulsive. And I remember saying, what bad choices got her to this point, you know? And I heard God's voice just clear as it is. A bell and it said oh really would you like to see how I still see my daughter and I went and I stopped right where I was at and I went yeah and I turned back to her and I saw this homeless person and this their spirit came out of their body and started floating in front of their face and it was almost like you could see through it like this hologram 
and their spirit was made of gold dust. It kind of looked like, and it was this shimmery gold dust. And her spirit was the most beautiful, like unearthly beauty, like take your breath away beauty. And I'm staring at her with my mouth just agape. And I was like, and she's looking at me like my teeth slid off my cracker. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with this idiot? And I heard God's voice and he said, this is how I still see my daughter. And I went, wow, I'm a judgmental asshole. I mean, excuse me for swearing, but that's how I thought of myself, you know, like I'm a jerk. And um, I was so blown away with how beautiful this God saw this person that we would look upon and go, they failed. They failed at life. And this is how God still sees them. And I knew at that point that I could never judge anybody again. You know, that we are all on our journey. And in God's mercy, in his eyes, we are all perfect. And through him, we are made perfect. And this is how he still, this, this is the unconditional love that he talks about. That it wasn't like he's disappointed with us, but he sees us this way still. And that was such a poignant experience. And then I had one other one before the end of this two-week period. And I was trying to be perfect, you know. And I thought, well, I've had this near-death experience. I've had this God change experience. I've seen an angel. I need to be, like, the most perfect. I got to quit swearing, which obviously I haven't done that very well, <laughs> but <Neither>. um, <laughs> right. I, I need to be perfect. And this is what I was thinking with, you know, to myself that I needed to be this, this holy person that didn't make mistakes. And I was trying to be perfect. And I remember messing up and committing a sin. And I was so upset with myself. I went home and I got on my knees and I prayed for two hours like just pouring my heart out to God. Like, I don't know how I can do this. I'm such a piece of white dog crap on the side of the road because I promised you, I gave my life to you. I have had these experiences. that I know you're real. It's not faith anymore. This is a knowledge. And yet I still, you know, like the scripture dog returning to his vomit, I still succumb to my sins and I still fail and I still do these things and I'm so sorry. And I'm just, I got the biggest mental stick I have and I'm just beating myself with it. Just like what a piece of crap I am. And I'm so sorry. And I'm begging God for forgiveness. Well, I get done and I'm just emotionally wrung out like a dish rag, you know, like I have nothing left in me and I crawled into bed and I shut the light off and I was just starting to go to sleep and I saw this gold coin about the size of a small salad plate floating in front of my face. And I was like, what the heck? Like I've never done drugs. I'm not, I know I'm not hallucinating. Am I having a stroke? You know, what's going on? And I put my hand through it and it wouldn't change it. And it was this old kind of Roman looking coin with like this guy in profile and he has those fronds in his hair, you know, right here above his ear, and like an old Roman emperor looking dude. And I'm looking at the coin, and it's this beautiful gold coin. And I'm like, what is this? I remember saying that. I heard God's voice, and he says, this is you. And I'm like, okay, that does not clear up anything, you know, like what? I'm the old dude on the coin. I don't know what. And then the coin starts to rotate, and it slowly turns, and it turns all the way around. And the backside is so corroded. Like it looked like it had been at the bottom of the ocean. Had like this, you know, corrosion over the top. You can't even see what the design on the backside was. It was so corroded and black. And then God said, I love both sides of you the same. And I still didn't quite get that. Like, I don't get it. And then I, now I do. Like he loves the side of me that's perfect. The side of me that is this warrior for God. The side of me that is this loving, moral, perfect person. But he also loves the side of me that screws up. He also loves the side of me that makes mistakes. He loves the side of me that fails and falls down. Unconditional. And he, yeah, and he loves both sides of me the same. 
So then I, I go to sleep and I'm just trying to process this whole thing. And I have this vivid, vivid dream that didn't even seem like a dream. It felt really real if you've had one of those before. And I was in the forest and I'm going through the forest and I've got this huge canvas sack on my back and I'm carrying this. And if you've ever gone like through the scrub oak or anything and got caught in it, I'm getting scratched by branches and my sack's getting hung up and I'm trying to make it through and navigate my way. But I had, all I remember is having this panicky feeling to get out of the forest, like really bad panic. I had to get out of there. And I'm trying to find a way and I look off to my left and I see this path running along beside me. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to try to get over to that path because that looks a little clearer. And then I see a man come walking up the path and he's got a white robe on that comes down to about mid uh, calf. And he's got bare legs and sandals on. And I knew instantly who it was. I could never make it through this story. I knew instantly who it was. And I dropped to my knees. And I just, I started to bawl. And the Savior came and stood in front of me. And I remember looking down and I could see the wounds in his feet. And I just remember like, just feeling so exhausted and so worn out. And the Savior said, give me your burden. And I hugged it and I, and I pulled it back toward me. And I'm like, no, I love you too much. This would hurt you. No, I'm not. I'm not giving it to you. I don't want to hurt you. I love you too much. And the Savior said, it's already mine. I've already paid for it. And I went, oh, yeah like 2000 years ago. And I remember pushing it toward him and then he knelt down and I was, all I was doing was looking at his feet. I couldn't look him in the face and he lifted my chin up and he made me look him in the eyes and he had the most beautiful kind eyes I've ever looked into. And he looked at me and he said, your sins are forgiven. And I woke up just bawling from that, just bawling. And those were such defining moments. And it, I don't know if it's been with you, but it's like it's been years since I've had anything like that happen. And there, it's been years where you even start questioning yourself, like, did that really happen? You know? And, but it was so poignant for me. Like, I remember every detail of my near death experience, I remember every detail of that dream and how. It made me feel and how I am enough for God and how we all are and that he loves us unconditionally. And that's the thing we came down here to experience. We came down. You do not know what you are until you know what you're not. You do not know what a beautiful spring day is until you've gone through a hard winter. You know, you've gone through like here in Utah, we had the just the most snow and cold, terrible winter we've gone through since like the early, early 80s. We got so much snow and it was just constant and it was so cold. And I remember the first day of spring and it was like 50 degrees and I'm out there in a t-shirt going, whoa, you know, and it's just, just so much joy. And it's that contrast that gives us joy. We have to know what we're not. We have to know what it's like to be sick even appreciate what it is to be healthy. We have to know what it's like to be old, to appreciate youth. We have to know what it's like to have our heart broken to really know even what love is. So it's the gifts of this opposition. It's the gifts of what's going on in your life that made you what you're not to help define what you are, which is love. And love and this beautiful purpose of sharing this and it's like that's the time that i feel alive that's the time that i feel best is when i'm talking to people about god when i'm explaining my story to them and i get to share with them i'm not a perfect man i am far from perfect but i do love god and i know god loves me and if he can love me he can love anybody you know type of type of thing 
because I am not perfect, you know, and I've made so many mistakes. And yet, because of that, because of the love that he has for me, drives me to share my story, drives me to explain to people how he feels about them, how you are perfect right where you're at, that you are, you have purpose being here. You have purpose sharing your love with others and your story. How important is your story for someone? How important is your story to lift somebody else up? And that's kind of my message and kind of what I do. And so I've done photography for all those years. And I was uh, kind of feeling like I wanted to give back again. And one of the ways I loved feeling like I was of service was being a firefighter. So at 52 years old, I went back through the fire academy, had to redo all my certificates, um, get my fire one, my fire two, my hazmat, um, all the, the different certificates that I've got now. And then I got my EMT and my advanced EMT and then paramedic. And I'm back in a job where I feel like I can make a difference and that I get to serve people every day and that I get to make a physical difference. So like firefighters don't get paid a lot of money. <laughs> so it's like, it's a poor career choice um, that way, but it's a great career choice for feeling like you're making a difference. And the one thing, so I'm really glad that you reached out to me because the one thing that I kind of feel like I've let slip lately is speaking to people about God. And there was a time I did that so much, you know, and I, I wrote a book. Um, I don't know if you've seen that one. It's on Amazon. It's called you were born a warrior uh, by Ryan Rampton. And um, it. I'm actually in the process of rewriting it right now because I've had some experiences since then I wanted to add in, but it goes through about 20 different near death experiences and all the things that happened in my life and the, uh, the crazy ways God has saved me. And I can never figure out why he kept saving me and you know, why he let this person pass and why he saved me when I didn't feel worthy to be saved. And, you know, but God always has his purpose. God always knows what he's doing. You know, we may not. And, uh, but I, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today and to tell you how much God loves you, that you're absolutely perfect, just how you are, that where you're at right now, this moment is where you're supposed to be. And that the experiences that you're having help define you. And help, rem help you remember what you are and define what you're not. So, anyway, I think that's about all I got. You have me levitating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Yeah. Um, this thing about being unworthy and worthy. I did yeah. not realize till I was 55 years old and talked to a publisher about publishing my book. And the first thing I said to him was, I don't think it's worthy. And he's a <laughs> former monk. And he said, it's worthy because you're worthy. And right. I could not understand. Yeah, you know, I'm 62 now. Seven years. Why that affected me. And I've talked about that until I heard you talking to Lee Whitting this morning. I was listening to you're uh, on into e-radio, your interview yeah. with him, and you were talking about something about worthy and unworthy. And it dawned on me, I had lived 55 years feeling unworthy. Right. You know, uh, I was abused as a child. Then my ex didn't love me. Like nobody loved me. Uh, coworkers hated me. And I went through my entire life feeling unworthy of love. And didn't know it because it was such a part of my DNA. And when he said that to me, you know, my the publisher said, it's worthy because you're worthy. And I have said since then, it healed me on the spot. And I didn't realize how or why until I was listening to you this morning on Lee that, oh, my gosh, I hadn't lived 55 years feeling unworthy. Right. And all it took was him to say, it's worthy because you're worthy. 
I was like, and isn't that, that is a beautiful? powerful, a powerful word, worthy. It is because think about it. We came down here to feel not worthy. So we knew what we're not like. I always relate it back to, you know, Michael Jordan, that story. He got kicked off the high school basketball team. They told him, pick a different sport. You're not meant to play basketball. Are you kidding me? Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, right? Arguably. But like he was kicked off the team because he was not worthy. Well, that drove him to go shoot a thousand free throws every day. That drove him to push himself to become what he considered worthy. We do the same thing in this life. We have experiences that tell us we're not worthy. We have people that reject us. We have experiences where we fail, where we hurt people, where we sin. We do these things that are against our character, that are against our who we are. And so we feel unworthy. We feel just terrible about ourselves. And God says no. The monk said no. You are worthy. And it's like it's an aha moment where we're like, yeah, you know what? We were kind of set up. If you think about this, I always loved the movie Avatar, you know, the big blue guy. So remember, he gets in, he controls his body. Well, our spirits are in this avatar. Our spirits are in this avatar that's imperfect, that is going to fail. But our spirits are perfect. We are worthy. But our, but our avatar isn't. And it's not meant to be. It's meant to be a certain way to teach you. And by being imperfect, teaches us. Teaches us compassion, forgiveness, all of these traits that we would never know. If you think everybody was perfect, we would never know compassion. We would never know forgiveness. We would never know any of these high vibration things that we experience it's because of our unworthiness that we get to feel these things it's because that we felt unworthy but the one of the other perfect analogies that god shared with me one time was the pendulum if you think about this so some people in this life they're a pendulum and they swing a little bit this way into like we'll say sin or suffering you know uh, some people swing farther death of a child or loss of a spouse some people swing farther like Christ that took on every sin, every emotion, every feeling of not being enough that you could ever feel and swing way over here. But when you swing back the other way, it swings equal to what you experience. So if you experience a lot of suffering this way, well, guess what? This is your, your joy is. It's equal to that. And that's what's so beautiful about this is, when you let yourself swing into God's love and accept it, accept that you're worthy. This joy that you feel is exactly equal to the pain and the sorrow that you felt. Um, there's a book called The Prophet by K uh, Cahill Gabram. I think I'm saying that right. But he, in there he says, even the flute that makes a beautiful sound was hollowed out with knives. So... He, like he talks about pain and suffering and how the joy and suffering are bedfellows. And when one's sitting at your bed, the other's standing up or, you know, and it's like they, you have to have both to really experience this fully. And that's why this life is so beautiful. We get to come down here and experience these things. Um, if everything was all light all the time, we would have no definition. Everything would just be pure white blinding. But because we have darkness, because we have shadow, we see form, we see shapes. It helps define things. And I think that's just what's so beautiful about, you know, what we experience is that we get to define who we are again through this love. The Prophet, is that a really old book? Yeah, it is. I think in the movie Walk the Line about um, Johnny Cash, oh, Reese that. Witherspoon that plays Jim, yeah. she hands him that book, The Prophet. Yes, and yes, she the, did. Yeah. And it's one of my favorites. When I And I relate, I sing Johnny Cash. So he's my favorite go-to for karaoke. My wife's an amazing singer. We do Jackson together, <laughs> you know. And uh, she sings June Carter just like, you know, and it's, it, 
everybody saw like that was amazing you know but um and my she's, middle name is great, June. <laughs> oh it is so johnny after my like, mom's little right name my heart. Uh -huh. so i do remember when she gave him that book and it's a beautiful book i really recommend it to look it up uh cahill cabron's that and it's called the prophet and i don't remember how long ago it was written but it's it's very very old and uh but there's just so much wisdom in that. And when you think about all the different ways, it's kind of funny because we start thinking that God is a certain way, you know. And I always like you've got a piece of paper with a hole punched in it. And you're like, wow, I can see the sky through this hole. You know, and you're and somebody else says, no, that's not the sky. This is the sky. And they're looking through their hole. And then God pulls all the papers away and like, no, th this is the sky. It's all of it, you know. And we get caught up into our way has to be the right, right way, where really you have an individual path to God. You have an individual course that God's guiding you on, that he's bringing you along and he's teaching you along the way. And that's the perfect path is your path. It's not my path. Like I can't share with people, hey, this is the key to everything because no, it's only been the key to my life. And heck, most of the time I messed it up still. So, you know, thank goodness for grace. <laughs> it amazes me that God knows within a couple words, a short sentence, what to say. That's exactly <laughs> what we need at that time. Absolutely. And when I was 35, my ex, you know, we've been married 16 years, had three boys, and he asked for a divorce and et cetera. And then he took the boys for their first visit and, the house is quiet. I'm alone. We're out in the country. You know, TV and radio, everything's off. It's silence. It's like the silence hurt, you know, yeah. not having my family there. And I, I'm the type of person, you know, I don't cry for anybody. And even though even my ex. And so I went in the bathroom, shut the door. And like for the first time, I don't know when I sat and bawled and bawled. And as I'm crying, I'm thinking, you know, my family, you know, my siblings, parents didn't love me. Now I find out my husband 16 years never loved me. And I'm bawling. And I'm thinking, why? You know, feeling unlovable. And I heard in front of the mirror, I heard God's voice clearly say, my child, <laughs> that's all. He needed to say, like this hot yeah. face was now full <laughs> tears. I'm jumping up rejoicing. A few hours later, my ex calls, and we want to go to this party down the river. And there was all these people down the river, and there was a band there. And I danced by myself for hours and hours, not speaking to anybody, not looking at anybody. I blocked everybody out. And my ex keeps trying to get me to come go with him, get on the boat. And I think he was going to kill me that night. <laughs> and, you know, asking for the boards didn't tear me up. Didn't, he didn't get to see me fall apart. So I think he was going to what he intended to earlier was just go ahead and kill me. But um, I'm like, no. And I just, my feet were black for weeks from dancing barefoot. And I have a little That's bit beautiful. of American Indian in me. And I got thinking last night about that. And I was like, it was like I was doing an Indian dance. Yeah. I was this stomping, doing this like a rain dance or something. And I could tell every once in a while, the corner of my eye, I catch people just staring at me. I mean, other people were dancing too, but they right. were stopping, you know, like normal people. I wasn't. I was in a zone for hours and hours. Just, and all I could think about was my child. And yeah. nobody yeah. needed to hear about it. It was just for nope. me. I was free for the first time That's in my beautiful. life. At 30, I was free. And felt accepted because God said that. So. That's so beautiful. You know, I think he always gives us the experiences that we need. And uh, how you were talking about God, like he, he does the perfect thing. One of the hardest concepts for us to understand is that God is outside of time. Where we're stuck in this timeline that God created for us to experience life. And so... For us, it's like a river or a road or a timeline. You know, here's World War II, here's Korea, blah, blah, blah. And it goes along this way. It's linear. But for God, everything's this way. The axis is turned 90 degrees, so everything's now. So, like, right now, God is, uh, Christ is being born. We're having this conversation. You're being born. You're getting married. You're dancing. All of that stuff is happening right now for you. Like everything is the now for God. And 
he's not trapped in this time like we are. And that's why he knows alpha to omega, the beginning to the end, because it's all one whole. And our little finite minds cannot even wrap themselves around that. You know, how in the heck is all this going on at once? No, it's got to be linear. You know, that's that's all we understand. That's all we've ever experienced. But it really is beautiful how God knows the outcome. He not only knows Peggy when she's five years old, but he knows Peggy when she's 85. Even though she's, what, 60, you said now? <laughs> 62? Anyway, he knows you at 82, too. He knows everything you're ever going to do. And he loves everything about you in every version. And where we are so, this journey is for us. This journey is a journey for our self-discovery and to find out what we're not and what we are, you know? And so the timeline's for us. It's not for God, not for us to prove to God that we are worthy. I think that's one of the biggest lies that we've ever been told is that we have to prove to God that we're worthy. Like that, I grew up um, Mormon, LDS, right? And I had never felt less worthy, you know, when I experienced that, when I knew that, like that I was not perfect and that I had to prove my love to God and that I had to do these things. And until I experienced you know, what I did with these two things. And the funny thing is, is I would tell religious people like spiritual leaders and stuff in my church about it. And I remember one time this church leader, I told him about what happened to me with Christ, my vision. And he looked at me and he says, Ryan, Christ cannot forgive you until the church does. <laughs> Aren't they and superior? I, it, it, Right. You know, it just kind of caught me off guard. But it's it's so funny because they get caught in this worthiness trap, right? I had to prove my worthiness to the church, and then the church would give me the stamp of approval, which would prove to God that I'm worthy. And they get it all backwards. God already says we're worthy. God already says we're perfect. God already says we are love. And it's up to us to find that out. Now, if we don't ever find that out and we stay trapped in our cycle of, of abuse and mistake, we don't grow. There is no growth. So we have to get through that. And so whether you call that sin or you call it mistakes or you call it life, call it unworthiness, when you swing to that other side of that pendulum swing and you're in that joy and you're in that love and you're in that worthiness, that's where pure joy resides. That's where our souls rejoice. That's where we dance for hours. That's where we know we're worthy. But we have to have these experiences, whether it's a church or an ex-wife or an ex-husband telling us we're not worthy so that we can experience that and then go, no, guess what? I am worthy. Yeah, I'm grateful for, I mean, I can look back. I'm finally at the point. I can look back everything and say, I'm I'm grateful for that because yeah. it made me where I am and who I am now that I could have never have been, never achieved or understood, been this compassionate, I feel, right. and understanding um, if I hadn't went through everything that I went through yep. and all the rejection just made me try to be good, try to be good, more rejection, try to be good, try to be good enough. It didn't matter if you made straight A's in college, if you graduated college, if you had this great career, you were never good enough. You were trash. Never. They let you know all the time that you were trash. You weren't as good as anybody else. And so what did I do? I kept trying to be good. <laughs> and then I'd stop and I look back and I see how they were never at my level. Do you know what I mean? Right. They were cheating on their spouses. They were becoming alcoholics. They weren't going to college. They weren't getting the good careers. They were staying down there in their muck thinking they're superior. Right. You know, and, and what's really funny, it's like, I actually think social media has enhance that because if you think about it 
everybody on social media to a big extent is like, look how amazing my life is. Look how worthy I am. Look how. <laughs> and so you, when you're scrolling through that, you're like, wow, I'm not very worthy. Like I, I haven't been to Bali. I haven't, I don't get to go on vacation. I, I don't get to do this, <laughs> you know? And so it's all these things that just compound it. And we need little reminders that we are worthy. We need little reminders. Um, one of my favorite sayings is that the sword is not fond of the forge that made it, but it is grateful for the strength that it achieved from going through the forge. And so that's just like you, what you were describing. We're not fond of the process that we went through, but we are grateful for it because it did make us into the strong piece of steel that we are now. You know, and that's that's really what's so beautiful is the process. Yeah, and the people that got to show the pictures of their steak dinner, what they're eating, and their pictures on, you know, they went to a carnival cruise or whatever. I was like, right. that's all their Facebook is. It's like, look at me, look at this, look at this. And they're like, what's their life in between? <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's the thing. We, we all are unworthy. We all struggle. We all put up a facade. We all try to make it look like we're this wonderful, amazing person. And guess what? We're all human and we all need God's love. Every one of us. I mean, from, you know, the people that despise me, the people that criticize me, the people that hate me, they need God's love too. Mm -hmm. And the only reason they do what they do is hurt people that are hurt inside, hurt people. Yeah. When I started doing this, people started trying to put me on a pedestal. I'm like, oh, don't do that. You'll be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and that's the funny thing is like, you're never a hero in your own country, right? People that know me close, like I have a couple of my kids, I'm not sure even believe in God. You know, they've gone through parts and they told me they're atheists, even though I've had my experience. So you're never a hero to the people that know you close because you do, you're, you are human and you will, you will make mistakes, but people see you outside like I've run into people that are like, they, they think, yeah, same thing that I walk on water. And I'm like, oh, no, not even remotely. You know, I could walk on water when it's frozen, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that's about it. Yeah. Just because I'm Christian doesn't mean that I'm perfect. I mean, I say like, I'm a Christian no. and they assume that means, oh, you go to church every Sunday. You never cuss. You know, no, I don't go to church and I cuss daily and I don't right. need to. I don't like to quit, but. <laughs> Just, yeah, me too. <laughs> but then again, I'm a fireman. I can't. <laughs> so, you know, um, I do, I'm going to link yeah. to Lee's video with you because you went through a lot of stuff before you got your NDE. I'd like for people to hear other people. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and a lot of that's in the book, too. If anybody wants to pick that up on Amazon, I'll put a link um, to your book in there, too. Or they can contact me. Um, I'm always happy to sign books. You leave your email in there yeah, in the you, description. Yeah, okay. leave my you can leave my email. Uh, people are happy to con or you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that I that I can for people. Okay. Um what is I, I really do feel my purpose, like my only purpose in staying when I made that deal with God, like I was done. My purpose now is to share his love and to tell people of God's love. Like that's the reason I'm here. I'm not here to make a lot of money. I'm not here to, you know, do all the things I do. Hey, don't get me wrong. I do like money and I do like traveling and I do like being spoiled, but that's not my purpose anymore. You know, my purpose is to teach people of God's love. That's when I feel alive. And that's when I know I'm living my purpose. I was on Dr. Oz a couple of years ago talking about my second NDE. And afterwards I was on a podcast and the girl said, on during the show, if you're going to be famous, and I had a couple other Indians tell me this too about that week, said if you're going to be famous, you need to lose weight. <laughs> I'm not losing weight for nobody. <laughs> no, no, you know, hey, thanks for sharing your perspective, you know, but um, th there's actually famous people that are overweight too, and they're loved just fine, you know, and it, it's like people always. 
think, well, if you do it this way, it's going to be better. You know what? We'll do it that way for you. You know, this is the way I'm doing it. And uh, yeah. I, I, I guess I should have told her, if you're going to have a podcast, you shouldn't be so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> You There's know, a joke like, um, I might be fat, but I can lose weight, <laughs> but you're ugly. <laughs> you so know, anyhow. And that, that's it. And, and the funny thing is the people who make comments like that, it always kind of breaks my heart a little bit for them because they, they're hurting. They wouldn't have made a comment like that to try to cut you down if they felt good about themselves. Well, the NDE felt, world like, was there was furious that I was on NDE. They were all even yeah. on my wall saying, "Her, why her? Her book isn't bestseller. She isn't this and this speaker. She's not da 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 da." They're like, "Who is she?" Like, you know, they thought I was this unworthy. <laughs> like, they kicked me out of Ions because I'm Christian, and then I went on Dr. Right. Oz, and they're like, "What? We thought we ruined her." <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, and, and that's that's so funny. Like, even. Even us that have had these experiences and that the ones that we should be like uplifting each other and understanding God's love even more, we also fall back into the petty humanness. We fall back into criticizing each other or mm -hmm. comparing. You know, it, it's so funny because competition and comparison is a very low vibration. It's a very... Um, you know, just low, you know, when you raise your vibration and you're into that higher, there is no competition. We're all cheerleaders for each other. We're all like, yes, that's awesome. You should be on, you know, and yet we're all human. And it's so easy to slip back into that. As long as we have this body, as long as we're taking breaths, I think we're going to struggle with our humanity, you know, yep. and we're going to struggle with, with being petty, we're going to struggle with um, judging other people. And realistically, that's our goal is to get rid of all that. Our goal is to be like God, you know, get rid of the judgment, have nothing but unconditional love for everyone. Nothing but this pure spirit about us. But, you know, when I start feeling a little floaty, I usually just say a few swear words. So I kind of ground myself again, you know, or <laughs> Actually, I'll make a mistake. This morning. <laughs> yelling when, at another driver. <laughs> when you, I was walking through the house, I had my phone, listened to you on Lee, and you were telling about the electrocution. And I don't remember what point in there I went, ah, I said, yeah, we're through the house. Like, because what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I kind of said the same thing when it happened to me too. <laughs> like, you know, and I and I just remember being so upset about how I was going to die, which is totally ego too. When you think about it, like I wasn't um, upset that I was dying. I was upset in how people would perceive me from my death. Yeah. Like I wanted to be a hero. In my death, you know, saving that little boy when I was like, uh, when we were in the flashover, um, not dying from stupidity, like making myself look dumb, you know, and it's like that again is just all ego. It's all this low vibration, you know, and if I can look at it going, wow, whatever way, you know, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful experience, you know, and it's that's funny, a higher but vibration. When we think back or into ease and what we thought at the time. And, you know, I was almost in a head on collision a couple years ago and I wasn't, but um, I was like saved from that. But I was like, really? I'm dying right now. This beautiful Saturday afternoon. Like I'm not even 10 miles from the house. I'm just going to the store. It's almost up there in the past horizon. I can almost see it. I'm going to die right now like this. Like <laughs> when I was 25, um, then when I was waiting to go, once they seen I had to go to surgery and I'm waiting to go back as I was an organ donor, I had to sign those papers and I went for it to come get me, take to surgery. And they had called my whole family. I didn't know at the time said, you know, what going to make it. But so I'm thinking I'm not going to live through surgery. You know, I'm thinking I'm dead. Like I'm not going to live through the surgery. And I'm really mad because like the doctor would have seen it the night before when I called this three times during the week. And so I'm thinking all these things. I remember thinking, I told about it. I think maybe on Lee's show or somewhere before that, 
I remember, I'll be honest, I remember 25 and I'm like 105 pounds. And I remember thinking, why am I dying right now? I'm young and I'm pretty. Why not some <laughs> fat, ugly old person? Like, why me? And I look back like how awful I was to think that. Like, <laughs> that's mean. But that's what I thought. But that's not the thoughts I had in heaven. You know, it was all about my no, boys. I no. can get back and I got to raise my kids. It was nothing about me whatsoever. And then a few yeah. hours later, I'm thinking thoughts like that. It's like you can see the difference how we feel in our soul versus in our mind. completely. Right. And it's so funny when you're in your soul and you're connected to God, when you hear somebody say something like that, you don't even judge them. You're like, oh, my God, you're so cute. Like, and I know that's what the angels do to me all the time. They're like, oh, you are so cute. That is just <laughs> adorable, you know, because we, we are like little kids, you know, and the comments we make, you know, and the, the low vibration stuff we do, it, it is cute. And you just got to remember that, you know, it's like you were talking um, one of the, I don't know if I talked about this on Lee's um, podcast that I did, but. I I got into a head-on collision. So I was coming back from Las Vegas. I'd been down there speaking at a near-death experience conference. And I was coming back, had all my books in the back. And the funny thing was, is I was trying to get everybody to go down with me. This was my very first big speaking forum where I had a bunch of people in the audience. You know, I'd done little ones up to this point. And I was so proud of it. You know, I was like, oh, this is going to be really cool. <clears throat> they're paying for me my hotel and all this and so i go down there nobody and my wife like at the time well we, we were just dating we she was just my girlfriend then and she her heart got heavy and she's like i'm not supposed to go and i'm like oh okay you know and she's very spiritually in tune and so she decided not to go so i invited my daughter and my granddaughter and then they backed out the last minute. And then I invited my best friend and his wife, and they backed out the last minute. And I invited my mom, and she backed out. Well, so I go down all alone, kind of feeling kind of sorry for myself. Nobody wants to be with me on my big debut, blah, blah, blah. Go down there, speak. I'm coming back from it. And I'm, I just got outside of St. George, Utah, heading north on I-15, and almost to Cedar City. When um, I had gotten some ideas about a second book and about the nature of God. So I was getting this download. So I decided to record it on my phone. So I'm recording it on my phone and talking about it. And I got done. And I remember how much opposition I got when I was writing my book about my near-death experience. Like so much opposition, like just about killed me. Like the terrible, terrible, horrific things that happened to me while I was writing that book. So I said a little prayer and I said, you know, Heavenly Father, um, if I get as much opposition writing a second book as I did in my first one, I will really need your protection. And I just barely finished praying for protection. And I looked at the road and I'm in the fast lane doing 85 in the just cruising along, not very much traffic on the road, just flying up the highway. And I looked down, I started an audio book on my phone. And then I looked back up and I saw a red pickup truck falling out of the sky, upside down. Like the movie Twister. Remember that, you know, yeah, I the did. movie? So I see this truck going wham and hits the ground and comes toward me like this. And I'm like, my brain couldn't even process what was happening. And so I slammed on my, tried to slam on my brakes, but it was instantly hit me and the truck just comes apart. So I'm in this SUV, it was a Chrysler Aspen and something encased me in a force field and pieces of metal come flying at my face and then go up and around me. And like, I end up on the side of the road and I'm trapped in this metal co cocoon where Everything around me smashed up into me, but I was completely untouched. I remember the airbag going off and flattening out in front of me like it couldn't hit me. And I thought, that is so weird. Why, like, like being a firefighter, I go on people all the time that have airbag burns or shoulder harness, you know, broke, broke their clavicle. And I was just like completely held still 
where none of that touched me. And I get done and I'm looking around and there's metal here. I could barely turn my head and I'm encased in this and even the dash bent around my knee. So I've got my knee in the dash and the dash has like the metal went around my leg and I'm trapped in there. Well, this guy comes up and he's trying to open the door and pry me out and get me out of there. And I ended up getting out and I looked at it and right in front of me, everything was smashed flat to the right of me where my wife would have been was smashed all the way to the seat. Like if she would have been there, she would have been squished, decapitated, dead. Anybody, the back seat directly behind me was smashed all the way down to those seats. Like the whole truck was completely, except for this little cocoon where I was. And I walked it away from there without a scratch on me, like completely intact. My knee wasn't damaged by the metal bending around it. Like, you know, why wouldn't knee, the knee break versus the metal? And nothing. Like I, I walked away and the I remember the police officer coming up to me and going, wow, did anybody check on that white truck? Is that guy dead? And I'm like, no, that's me. I'm, I'm fine. And he's like, you were in it. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, and you're walking. And I'm like, yeah. And he just shook his head and walked off, you know. <laughs> But I've got all these pictures in my book of that, of the um, the accident. And it's just, it was such a miracle. You know, I mean, some of these NDEs, like that one alone, like there's no way I should have walked away from that, let alone without a scratch. Like I should have been dead. Like, you know, one of the things that happens in your body is when you go from 85 miles an hour to a sudden stop you have what's called a coup contra coup injury in your brain where your brain splashes forward, hits the front part of your skull, bounces like a rubber ball back and forth and causes brain damage. Your heart is disconnected by some large blood vessels, the aortic arch and your vena cava and all this. Just, just Your heart's not held together by anything but these blood vessels. So a lot of times when you have a sudden stop like that, your heart slams into your rib cage up front, and you'll get an aortic aneurysm or aortic tear, and you bleed to death internally. And it will kill you that way. So these are very common injuries in a very sudden stop. Well, I have none of that. I have no injury. Like none of that makes any sense. It's it's a miracle just as much as like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, or Daniel in the lion's den, you know, like those were unexplainable. So it was this, you know, there's like no way to explain away. And even like the heaviness my wife got, nobody would go with me. If anybody would have came with me, they'd been dead. Anybody in that truck other than me, you know, would have been dead. And it just kind of goes back to you know, God has a purpose for you. And in, in, until it is your time, it's not your time. And especially if you are living on purpose and you're trying to serve God, you know, your life will be extended and you have things to do. We came down here to learn things and to experience things. And some people, they learn and experience what they came to uh, learn quicker than others. Maybe I'm a slow learner. I don't know. <laughs> I keep getting. So I, 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 I kind of, after that one, I kind of figured out that I was not going to create any more near-death experiences. And I haven't since, knock on wood, you know. But, um, yeah, it's just one other little crazy thing about my life I thought I'd share. Very interesting. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we're done? All right. I think we've taken up everybody's time enough. <laughs> you know, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But thanks for listening, you guys. Thank you. I've enjoyed it very much. All right. Thanks again, Peggy. We'll talk to All you right. soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.